so it'd be great to hear from, from some of you as to well, any burning things you desperately want to say or ask, but also you know, what's brought you here so that we can hopefully um, meet your expectations and demands. So uh, anything that's emerged from your conversations that anyone wants to pass on? You will just want to sit there passively and be okay. great wisdom. Neither, neither me nor Henry that I was talking to have read a word by David Fleming. I just right. thought that was an interesting fact to put forward. Uh -huh. And so what, why, why are you here if you know nothing about people? Oh, little things draw you, you know. <laughs> I shall attempt to mention little things. <laughs> little coincidences and perhaps, you know... Um, I just thought it was more interesting to mention the fact that <coughs> these books are very new and they're not easy to get hold of even at the moment. Mm -hmm. yeah, Except so in the back of the room. Yeah, <laughs> I understand that. Yeah, I that uh, you know. But yes, I, I would need at least um, two minutes reading. Well, to, to read this. Oh, no, minutes. to read some of it, to get even an idea. You know, I'd need two minutes. Right, fair enough. <laughs> a any, anybody else? Uh, yes, um, so I co-founded Transition Town Kingston in southwest London, um, and then I wrote the second transition book, The Transition Timeline, um, and uh, I'm no longer living in Kingston, so I'm not actively involved with UPK, um, but it's still going very strong, and um, yeah, I've, I've sort of had some involvement with a lot of different ones, but UPK was my, uh, my home. say a few things about <laughs> balance between optimism and despair. Um, yeah, I mean, Jonathan says in his <laughs> foreword to, uh, to Lee Nogic that um, he was never completely convinced that David completely subscribed to the optimism that he, he professed <laughs> about, about humanity. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think that's going to come out, uh, all, a few aspects of what you said there are definitely going to come out over the course of the day. I mean, every time I <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> okay, great. Um, any, any other threads you can pick up on? Or? No? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, for me, um, thinking about uh, Brexit, I've been mm -hmm. thinking about it a lot over the summer, and probably most people have, um, but wondering like, where, where it's possible to apply pressure in terms of the knowledge that we've gained from, from what the vote drew up in terms of the information about the country and what's going on and sort of the divisions and polarisation. So, yeah, thinking about what, where, like, what, what information has arisen that we can use to uh, create positive change and empower people um, using that information. Great. That is definitely something I will talk about. Um, yeah. Um, I was lucky enough to know David a little bit. And he... Before he wrote Lean Logic, he, he actually developed a book which was about surviving the future, mm -hmm. which I, I sort of I loved because it was it was all of these different aspects of how we are going to survive a post-oil world, yeah. um, and all of the themes that come out of Lean Logic were in there. And I agree sort of well, the great thing about Lean Logic is you don't have to read it in one sitting; you just pick it up and flick through a, a section and then pick it up again. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've been looking at that. And I think the frustration I've got is that 
I, I see nothing in the wider uh, environment or in the wider <coughs> sphere that has progressed any more in the last 10 years from when I first sort of picked up a, a David Flynn book right. um, to now. And I just wondered how you, know, you two think that we can help try and progress it beyond these books. I'm just making notes here. Yeah. Um, okay, that's something we'll pick up. Uh, anything else, or shall we move on? One more? No? Okay, great. Um, right, well, I'm going to hand over to Jonathan for the next uh, 10 15 minutes. Um, so I'm sure many of you know Jonathan. Um, he and David were very long time friends, I think um, 30 odd years. And uh, Jonathan, were, and, well, Jonathan and David were very involved in. Um, Sort of picking up the, the ecology party as it was then by the scruff of the neck and um, pulling it into something with at least a, a some more electoral success. Um, and also the uh, co-founder of Forum for the Future, which has been a very influential organisation and until a few years ago, uh, chair, I think, of the Sustainable Development Commission, which was the sort of uh, government's advisory body on, um, on sustainability, which uh, Jonathan could tell infinite stories about. Um, but won't. Uh, oh, that went. But won't, apparently. <laughs> um, so on that note, I'll, uh, I'll hand over to you, John. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sean, and thanks to everybody for coming this morning. I was not certain how many people we'd have here today, but this is brilliant. Um, <clears throat> and the first thing I really want to do is to thank Sean for the uh, literally unbelievable amount of time and love and care and professionalism that he's put into this process. It is, okay, it's ended up as two products, as it were, but the process that lies behind it, this extraordinary attention to David's work to bring it into these two uh, formats has been remarkable. And I, uh, for me, just watching how you've done that has been something very special indeed. And hopefully it will indeed establish David as the remarkable, we were just chatting about adjectives you could attach to David, the um, remarkable contributor to many of today's big ideas that he really was. And that's, that's something I, I'm, I'm really waiting to see how the response to the books now will go and how people try and work out where David fits in a, in a sort of con continuity of ideas and people and movements and so on. Because he, he's not easy to pigeonhole, let's be honest. He's not always easy to read either um, because you have to have a certain circularity in your own mind not to get driven a tiny bit bonkers <laughs> by the lack of linearity. You know, if you're, as I warn in people in my own forward, if you're used to starting on page one, line one, and your game plan is to get as easily and effortlessly as possible to the final line on the final page of the book, having absorbed all the wisdom that is there, all the insights that's there in that kind of <laughs> directed linear way, Mm, it's going to be quite tricky because you may not be prepared for the, the almost um, obligatory tangential approach to things as you're taken off around circles. And some of the circles do end up back where they started and some of them don't. And then a circle leads to another circle. And it's a much more of a flow process, which personally I love. And obviously he loves it because you've had to work your way into it. So that your brains become a bit like that in terms of circularity. But it is, uh, it's quite difficult, therefore, to pigeonhole David in any respect. And actually, that was the reason, going back to the early work that we did together in the Ecology Party, and I was at the Green Party conference just two weeks ago, and because I was thinking a bit about David and thinking a bit about this book and the books and the launch and so on, I was thinking, how would David see the modern Green Party now? How would he relate to some of the big ideas that preoccupy the current Green Party membership and leadership and the responses that they're bringing forward to some of the same things that he was addressing 20, 30 years ago. And I think he'd still feel this combination of being at home amongst a body of people who are completely, completely serious about trying to rethink what progress looks like in the modern world and totally frustrated at the way in which the Green Party now, the Ecology Party then, finds it so hard to land those ideas, even though many people feel the same sense of frustration and anger about why we stick to a path that is 
transparently suicidal. And I do just want to come to this point, if I may, about dark optimism and David's kind of take on that. I mean, it's, it's a difficult one, this, because we probably, almost everybody I know, almost everybody, still subscribes to the idea that there is a way out of total collapse in the current system. Not completely everybody, but most people. Because once you go to that place psychologically, everything changes. You're suddenly in a very different place. David absolutely did not in any way try to ignore or deny the inevitability of collapse. And that made it quite interesting, because sometimes he'd be having a conversation about what needs to happen next. And because I would be thinking about how that would help a transition to a better place, David would be thinking, how will that help us prepare for the post-collapse reality that we're heading towards? And sometimes he was a bit brighter and shinier about that, as you described it, <laughs> shiny optimism. But sometimes he was deeply, darkly depressed by the inevitability of that collapse. And that is quite difficult to, to deal with because we're not good at handling collapsed scenarios, frankly. It's not really in our psyche to try and think things through the lens of inevitable collapse. Um, and he and I used to have endless rows about all of that because I don't, I didn't then, this is a long time ago, 35 years ago, and I don't now subscribe to a kind of collapse uh, view of the world. But David taught me more about why one doesn't need to subscribe to that view than anybody else, from my persuasion, as it were, who somehow continue with uh, lots of illusions hanging around as to what might happen. So I don't know how you describe David on the continuum of pessimism to optimism. I think you'd have to put him more in a sort of realism type position around which his own ideas would revolve in terms of whether he was up or down at any one moment. The reason why, when you poked him, he was so convinced about this is that he could see no way forward for our modern economy, the modern, global, neoliberal, market-based economy. He couldn't see how an economy that was permanently fixated with the need for economic growth, not just next year, and the year after, but economic growth indefinitely into the future. Let's not turn away from that. There is no conventional political party anywhere in the world that has any interest in trying to think through what we should be doing for humankind that doesn't have economic growth as the underpinning foundation for that notion of improving people's lives, now or tomorrow. So there's this still incredibly strong, I would say, all-prevailing view that progress depends on economic growth, more or less business as usual type economic growth, they've tweaked a little bit in some models, and that that economic growth is what we will continue to call on year after year, decade after decade, in order to improve the lot of people who at the moment don't, don't necessarily have good lives, dignified lives, the kind of lives that we would want everybody on this planet uh, to enjoy. And because of that, he came to the conclusion that this economy could only go in one direction, which was towards this collapse story. And it would collapse for one of two reasons. Either the growth economy would grind to a halt, in which case that society would collapse because people would be so unused to a no growth or a degrowth type economy that the social imbalances, the social implosion that would result from that would be so intense that the whole thing would collapse anyway. Or if it ignored all of that and continued to grow, it would collapse because we would trip every conceivable biophysical, climate-related, resource-related tripwire that you can imagine, in which case it would collapse because the planet would collapse around us. So if you're being as logical as David would insist that we should be about exit strategies for today's neoliberal market-based economy, you can see why you get to that point. And that's why he wasn't contemptuous of, but he was always gently wry and dismissive about what I've called in my forward, these halfway houses, these places that people get to, to kind of escape this logic of collapse. Things like, how do we do growth better? How do we make capitalism work in ways that would be more conducive 
to coping with climate change, coping with equity, coping with the provision of public services in such a way that you don't necessarily need to keep on growing your economy to provide the requisite level of finance for the level of public service that you want. And you look at all these things, and I'm, I'm sort of involved in a lot of these efforts to mitigate the worst impacts of today's neoliberal market economy, and David would always say, yeah, no, well, we probably do need to do a bit of mitigation work along the way, but let's not forget where that's going to take us. And indeed, in some cases, he would feel that the more, the more time and effort that we devoted to ameliorating the worst impacts of that economy, mitigating the worst impacts, the less helpful it was in shaping people's views about what needed to happen next. And that, I think, is the more interesting story what would happen next, because that was where David really began to develop unique ideas about the resilience of different systems, different economies, different countries, different communities, how we could do that if you could not fall back on the expectation of economic growth as the sort of answer to all our problems. And that's really where the essence of his inquiry was devoted. What is it that would allow us to build good lives for people in a world that didn't have as an automatic default another decade of growth, another decade of economic growth. And this is, I think, where some of the most astonishing stuff that David did comes into its own, this understanding that there are ways in which we can build the resilience of communities and of whole countries to increase that sense of culture which lies at the heart of all good living together. He's very fond of the word conviviality. David loved the notion of conviviality. I've, I've used that word with, with sort of regularity ever since then, because David not only lived convivially um, and very enjoyably, but he absolutely saw that any community, any society, any culture that didn't have conviviality, living well together at its heart, was extremely unlikely to prosper and thrive, even today in a growth economy, let alone tomorrow in a less growth or no growth economy. And I have been reflecting a bit on that in terms of the, the Brexit story, because it's a little unwise and sometimes dangerous to speculate, what would David have said about that? <laughs> but you can't help but think about that in terms of the Brexit story, because he would have been absolutely outspoken in his contempt for the worst aspects of the European venture, namely its over-dependence on a TTIP-style, a globalization-style of economy, where increased homogenization becomes the order of the day, people's individual identities in increasingly con conforming communities would be set aside and so on. And all of that stuff, he absolutely hated, but he loved Europe. He just loved the idea of, of Europe. He he, you know, if anybody would have stepped, stood up and said, I am a European, it would, be, it would have been David. And that conflict going on in people when they think about the European vote is a very interesting story, and there are, we've got a lot to learn from that. But he would have been particularly trenchant about the ways in which we've lost that notion of what community means to people. Very, very critical of how we've developed things like multiculturalism, about which he had a particular bee in his bonnet because he saw it as a tool to persuade people that it was okay, that we would learn to live together, whatever the diversity, whatever the numbers of people that we had to embrace and absorb into our, our own economy today. We'd somehow come through it with a little bit of slapped on multiculturalism. And of course, for him, that was just denying what community is all about, because it seemed to indicate that you could just intervene in such a way that people's sense of who they are in a community could be engineered to embrace the arrival of very large numbers of people who might not have any cultural connectivity with an individual in his or her community at this stage. You can see why that kind of idea was quite controversial and difficult for a lot of people in the Green Party to deal with because it seems to imply that maybe we have to think very carefully about uh, open borders approach, freedom of movement. How do you maintain cultural and community cohesion 
whilst being true to the highest ideals that you might have about ensuring that richer countries can work effectively to help poorer countries, can maintain a commitment to human rights um, in a very troubled world. How do we do that? And we don't do it well, is the truth of it. And one of the reasons why we're in our Brexit mess at the moment is that we haven't done that well for decades in this country, and many people felt that in the run-up to the actual uh, vote itself. So he keeps coming back to this notion of culture, and I guess if there's one thing where tons of stuff gets kind of piled together in a great big pot of heaving ideas, they're they come under this notion of culture. And if you couldn't find any other organizing principle in David's work, just stick it under culture. Because that sort of opens up another set of connections, of linkages between all the different things, whether you're talking about the arts, whether you write so brilliantly about, about religion, about a whole host of things to do with food, whatever it might be, all can be wrapped into this wider sense of, of why culture becomes the mechanism for providing for better lives in a, in a local economy that isn't growing. And that's the essence of it. That's why the transition time stuff was so important, that we are able to shape, grow, nurture mindsets and behaviors that rely on cultural cohesion to develop this route to progress for people without dependence on economic growth. So there's a completely logical story in the work that David was developing here. Sometimes that logic is all sort of mixed up in terms of these different tangents, but the logic is absolutely clear that that's what we really need to do. That's the emphasis on resilience. We have to get better at nurturing all of those different elements, those attributes in our society, in our community, in the way we lead our own lives, because it's only if we build up that sense of resilient civility, conviviality, a genuinely sharing economy that we'll get to the place where we can live well together tomorrow. <coughs> That's why his writing is always going to be uncomfortable for a lot of people because it isn't really the way progressive politics seeks to find answers to the problems that we face today. And I'm very involved in post-Brexit progressive political initiatives at the moment. I'm involved in two of these right now. I'm spending a lot of time doing that stuff. And I'm often thinking to myself, hmm, not sure that David would be very happy sitting in this room right now because it doesn't really answer the deeper questions that he was asking the whole time. Anyway, that's my starting thought. Look forward to the discussion later. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Jonathan's given us a bit of a sense there of um, just what a truly unique book uh, this is, um, in format as well, of course, being in, in dictionary format. And there's a lovely line from John Thacker who said, uh, I have never encountered a book that is so hard to characterise, yet so hard despite its weight to put down. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think that, that, yeah, that says a lot. And I'd actually like to just uh, read a little bit from David's introduction to his own book, um, which begins... Hang on, how does one deal with such a book? <laughs> is it a dictionary to be consulted for the occasional word? Is it a book to read right through, or some mixture of the two? Well, the answer to that is that it is a lean <coughs> book, and he talks a little about lean, I'll talk a bit about that in a moment. It does not have the last word. You, the reader, are invited to explore ideas from more than one point of view. Follow the links, build up your own familiarity with the key concepts in your own way. This is a community of essay entries about inventive, cooperative self-reliance. Each entry is complete in itself, but also joins up with others, and signposts to these connections are supplied in the entries. It is perhaps like arriving in a group or a community. You learn about its members and their relationships with each other by being in the middle of it. There is no beginning or end. The more you know the group, the more you yourself become part of it, and part of its story. It is a story about the shared experience of something discovered, something discussed, something done. Um, and what, what that creates is this sort of strange choose your own adventure experience where you you know you start wherever you like um, he suggests 14 questions at the start that might be of interest to you and entries that address them as a sort of way in and then follow the path of your interest through it um, and I found it 
particularly interesting during what Jonathan was saying that there really hasn't been a, a sort of left wing right wing divide in people who are finding this an interesting. <coughs> um, I mean, uh, Roger mm. Scruton is one philosopher very much associated with right wing thinking. Um, who uh, I can find his quote just here. Um, yeah, he says David Fleming predicts in environmental catastrophe but also proposes a solution that stems from the real motives of people and not from some comprehensive political agenda. He writes lucidly and eloquently of the moral and spiritual qualities on which we might draw in our descent to a lean economy. His highly poetic description of these qualities is neither gloomy nor self-deceived, but tranquil and inspiring. And I think this is a little dig at some of the rest of us. <laughs> All environmental activists should read him and learn to think in his cultivated and nuanced <laughs> way. <laughs> <laughs> Including Roger Scruton. And, um, and so, uh, and equally, you know, many, many voices from the left. So I think that's quite interesting. And I think also, as Jonathan again touched upon, this sort of divide that I find, I mean, especially with my work coming under this dark optimism banner, I often hear from people either side of that, is collapse inevitable <coughs> or not mm. divide. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was at the uh, Dark Mountain Festival, and Dark Mountain is very much a space that, um, explores what it might look like if, if, if we can't sort of win, if you like, if we can't solve climate change with our current models. And there was great enthusiasm for the books there. And I think, for me personally, I'm at a place, and I have been for a number of years now, where it doesn't interest me to work on things that assume there won't be a collapse. Um, I'm interested in things that make sense either way, and I think that's something which, um, which David really talks about, and Jonathan hinted at this as well, that he says, actually, it doesn't really matter what our predictions about the future are, because the only path forward in either scenario, or in any scenario, is based on, on community and on culture. Um, and as Jonathan says beautifully in his foreword, um, really, he proposes culture as, as the alternative to growth, if you like. He's, he says that um, the only thing that's going to hold together a cohesive society in the absence of the abundance of the growing market is a sense of, of community integration. Um, and what's very interesting, I find, I mean, he was here at Trinity College studying modern history, uh, which is why we're in this room today, courtesy of the uh, alumni department here. And, uh, and he makes a very strong case that this is actually how society thrived for almost all of human history, that this, this growth-based market economy has only really been about around a couple of hundred years. <coughs> Um, and that community and culture and what he calls the informal economy, what a lot of people call the gift economy, um, has been the basis of that throughout history. So it's not that he's invented this brilliant new idea that's going to save us all, but rather that he's saying, you know, we just need to go back to what's always worked. Um, and really, that emphasis on community, coming back to what we were hearing about scepticism about governments, um, I mean, he, there's a line in here where he says something like... Um, looking at the track record of governments throughout history, um, if we have an elderly relative with a similar level of decision-making and track record, it would be a kind thing to have them taken into care. Um, and uh, um, he was definitely not a fan of government and continually made the point that um, in the intervals between the, the great civic societies, the, the empires that our history is obsessed with, um, They've always collapsed. I mean, uh, he, he did an interview in the last year of his life where he said something along the lines of, um, I don't really hold it against capitalism that it's inevitably going to collapse because <coughs> civilizations do collapse. That's part of the wheel of life. But it's, it's going to be quite hard for it to live down the fact that it's going to take the whole of life on Earth with it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, he makes this case that always between the, the great empires and the great civic societies, it's been local communities, villages, the, the small scale that has kept the human story moving forward. And these sort of great flowerings come up when there's an abundance of resources and an abundance of wealth. And we're sort of obsessed with those, probably because we're living in one. Um, and I think part of the reason why his book is so unconventional to read, as Jonathan was saying, as, as you say, I find it a delight, but a lot of people will find it um, strange, is because he insists on your involvement. He doesn't let you sit there and be a, an audience hearing him speaking from on high. His, his whole way of thinking and writing and living was about engagement and conversation and community. And so he's like, as he says in that little entry I read, join the conversation, find your own path through it, read, follow up the references, follow up the endless notes that he left for other people that he suggested might be worth reading. 
Um, and so it's, it's kind of a demanding book, which is why I have mixed feelings, actually, about um, this paperback, which I created from his, his masterwork. Um, and the reason for that is that speaking with publishers, uh, they were understandably and that was rightly concerned that something this, this huge um, and this unconventional might be quite daunting to people. Um, and so very sensibly suggested that some sort of shorter, more accessible version would be a good idea. In Surviving the Future is more conventional, you, you do read it front to back, um, and obviously it's a lot shorter and a lot more accessible. Um, and so, you know, in some ways you lose some of the magic, because, yeah. because I have, I have um, taken David kicking and screaming into some sort of um, direct linear thinking. Because um, I think part of the, the reason why uh, David wrote this way is because he had such a holistic way of thinking. Um, you know, he tried to speak about anything and he found it hitched to everything else. And so every talk he would be asked to speak for 20 minutes on such and such and he would try to say the entirety of this. <laughs> because, you know, if you don't understand this, then where, how are you going to understand what I'm talking about? And so he really is starting from very different premises. And that's why I think a lot of people find it very challenging. He's, he's challenging a lot of the fundamental assumptions of our culture, really. Um, and that means that you have to understand some of the different concepts behind something before he can really talk about it in a, um, in a comprehensible way. Um, so hopefully, my, my hope really is that this, this paperback, Surviving the Future, is a sort of gateway drug, that people sort of read it and, and fall in love with David's way of writing and think, oh wow, now I want more, and then suddenly the, the, the great work doesn't seem so daunting. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I'll say, I mean, for me it's an immense privilege actually to, to be listed as the editor of this book. I mean, it is one of my two favourite books of all time, so to, um, to have the, the honour of being disassociated with it just um, feels, feels wonderful to me. Um, I mean, I, I had a, an email the other week from a, a writer in America called John Michael Greer, who I have a great deal of respect for, thanking me, <laughs> just saying thank you for lead logic. It's the, the most amazing thing I've read recently. Um, and, you know, this is, yeah, wonderful to have been a sort of midwife to the birth of what I think is a, is a genuinely important book. Um, and uh, what I think is, is we're here partly to talk about um, Brexit. And I think what's been, what's been fascinating to me in regard to that is it's really the first thing I've been asked to vote on as a, as a member of the electorate that I didn't immediately have a clear opinion on. Um, I mean, I've always voted Green, so I didn't dare to vote for either of the main parties. Um, and, um, and I, yeah, I could see both sides. I mean, as a, as a sort of coming from a transition background, I thought, well, I'm, I'm really interested in, in bringing things back to local control and to, to um, localising. Um, I found it very interesting that lots of my sort of green lefty friends found it completely obvious that we should stay in and completely obvious that Scotland should leave the UK. And I'd often ask, well, why, why the distinction and, and not get that clear answers? Um, and I also started thinking about what I've, what I've started calling um, guy exit, you know, Gaia exit, because that's really, that I'm very clear on. I'd quite like us to have a continued existence on the planet. And, um, and I started listening to some of the debates that people were having in that context, because I think at the global scale, there's a sort of immigration issue too. Um, there's a sort of border between the as yet unborn people and those of us who are already here. And, um, you know, I hear Nigel Farage saying, well, we can't possibly let more people in. It's completely... And I think, well, yeah, on a global scale, I can kind of see where you're coming from. You know, should we be excluding some of these <coughs> as yet unborn people from Im immigration to the planet? Um, should we be accepting that some of the life forms that are already here, particularly non-human life forms, are being forced to emigrate from the planet in order to make room for them? Um, and I found that quite an interesting, useful um, lens to view it through. And then after the vote, um, I mean, I, I, I voted in, but just. Um, in fact, I remember emailing Jonathan to ask him what he thought David would think about Brexit. Um, and, uh, but in the aftermath, I, I found it quite horrible, the, the division that the media have been, like the idea that everyone who voted out is just a racist or an idiot. Mm. Um, I, I find completely wrong. Um, and, uh, and I mean, there's a, there's a place called St. Ethelburgers, which is a church in London who their response to the Brexit vote I thought was wonderful. They held open listening days uh, where people would just come and say what they were feeling and people didn't respond and people didn't argue, but just everyone there could say what they were feeling. And I think this, 
recreation of community and of, of solidarity in the nation is, is an incredibly important response. Um, and so on that, I mean, I've found David's work strangely. I mean, he, he died five years before um, the Brexit vote. Um, but strangely, some of his writing, which I've obviously been very embedded in recently, has really helped me to understand. And there's an entry, there's a section here in his entry on nation, um, which I'd like to read. He says, a nation has an identity which connects the people who live there to a particular place and to each other. There is a landscape which many generations have shaped and defended, and there is an endowment of culture, language, and institutions which, though they can be betrayed, cannot be denied. The nation is a located, bounded, particular homeland, and if defeated, it often manages eventually to come back into being with a sense of renewal and justice. It exists in the minds of its people. Identity in this collective sense means that there is an identifiable meaning to the idea of we. And that, I think, that sense of identity is something that a lot of people who voted out have talked about. That's, the EU threatens that. You know, who, who, what is it to be British? What is it to be English? Is the EU just trying to take that away? Um, and I think David writes beautifully about that. And then, in terms of the, the question we had about sort of where do we go from here, um, I mean, I think a lot of the sort of unpredicted election results that we've seen recently, whether it's Corbyn elected as Labour leader, or whether it's Trump in America, or whether it's Brexit, we can see as a, as a, as a no, you know, as a rejection of the mainstream. I, I, I sort of look at Brexit and think, wow, so all the main parties agreed that we should vote one way, and that seems to have pretty much guaranteed that we vote the other, because we're like rejecting the mainstream. And I think the, the sort of global neoliberal agenda is not just, you know, <coughs> with terrible consequences in the future, but this sort of new feudalism called austerity is, is, is driving people into the ground now. You know, there's a, there's a real desperation there from a lot of people. Um, and this is why I've been, another reason I'm so proud to work on these books, because I think, you know, a lot of people have talked about the threat of fascism rising in times like this. Um, but if we look at the likes of Mussolini and Hitler, they didn't just come to power on, a, on an agenda of, of fear and othering. Um, they also raised wages and addressed unemployment and improved working conditions. And I think if that's seen as the only alternative to what we currently have, then it's likely to grow in, in support. It's likely to be supported and voted in. Um, whereas I think what David lays out, for me at least, is the most inspiring, compelling vision of what an alternative e economics could look like um, that provides a, a beautiful story of how we, how we help the desperate rather than that sort of rather despicable um, vision. His, his economics is based on sort of trust and loyalty and local diversity. Um, and uh, before, we, before we get some more sort of interaction going on, um, I'd like to read, uh, drawing on another one of the questions that came out, um, his fairly brief entry on uh, success. Um, and he writes, do you really think that we will get through this time and come in due course to a time of resilience, manners, and the homoic order? Don't answer that question. For you may discover to your cost that the answer is either a self-fulfilling or a self-denying truth, and that both count against us. If we deny that there is a livable future, then we will do little to secure one. If we affirm it, we come into other troubles, such as complacency, an optimistic view that what we are doing now is all that is needed, an iconic focus on the simple solution or the constant anxiety of life on the edge between hope and doubt. Positive thinking seems to be the right thing in circumstances until you notice the wreckage. Instead, think of what happened to Orpheus and Eurydice. Eurydice, you may remember, died after having been bitten by a snake, and Orpheus went down into the underworld to recover her. The goddess Persephone agreed to let her go on condition that Orpheus would not look back at her as she followed him. Unfortunately, he forgot about this condition, he did look back, with the result that Eurydice vanished forever, and Orpheus was torn to pieces by angry women who threw his head into the river Hebros, where it floated downstream, still singing. That is, make the intense commitment, at walking pace, plod on, climb steeply uphill out of the underworld, keep your eyes fixed ahead. You never know, you might get there, you might even find out where there is, and you might inspire others to come with you. Just don't look back. We do not need to choose between hope and expectation. What matters is to keep hope alive, which we won't succeed in doing if we are constantly checking up on it. 
It is not certainty that sustains our focus, but the ambiguity that comes to us, for instance, in the prayer from another ancient moment of commitment against the odds. Quote, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Huh. So, um, on that note, I think it's time to hear a bit more from you guys. Um, and actually, at that, at that Dark Mountain event a couple of weeks ago, I, it, that was my first uh, attempt to present these books to the world. And um, I wasn't quite sure how to do it, to be honest. And uh, what I did in the end was I was thinking, I really want to get across just how wide-ranging this, this dictionary is, like how much it covers. And so what I did, which turned out to work quite well, was literally get the audience to call out any topic they wanted, you know, not related to anything they'd heard about the book, but anything. Um, and then I would attempt to pull out <laughs> an entry from the book that, that, that spoke to that. Um, so, you know, don't feel the need to constrain yourself. I, I think um, we, can, we can address whatever your burning issues are. Um, but yeah, the idea for the next um, uh, half 40 minutes or so um, is just to, uh, to really discuss the books together um, and any other issues that are there for you. And uh, Jonathan and I will attempt to um, say something helpful. <laughs> Indeed. So, has anyone from any of that got any burning? Can I come back? I have started to read Surviving for the Future. Mm -hmm. In fact, some of it's already happening. Mm -hmm. And I was thought it interesting, he mentions the big system, well, not the, the big society. Yeah. And how local groups are coming together. But it all depends on just a few. Not everybody's going to sign up to this. Mm -hmm. And I've, another thing is, I think the UK will break up for, it, for us to survive Brexit. I don't know what others think. <laughs> that's that's what I think. Um, I think some of us hope that don't because I should disappear after <laughs> But I feel we're little Englanders. I, I'm I think myself European. I can't think I belong to I don't think I'm English culture. I don't think I'm a British culture. I don't know. I don't know what others feel like. Mm -hmm. But I thought it's quite interesting. I mean I I think it's quite, that book's quite easy reading. And I think a lot of this is happening now. And people are setting up community buses. We know in Oxfordshire, they have decimated <coughs> the bus service, particularly out in rural areas. But the gain is, the government is making people work longer. Mm -hmm. So what happens to small societies if there's nobody, they rely on the older people to run it? I mean, will small Communities survive. Mm. I don't know what you think of that. Um, yeah, I mean, this was this was very much um, one of David's concerns. Um, he uh, he says that you know the challenge we face is immense, and it's that much greater if the people facing the challenge don't turn up in the first place. Um, and uh, his. Uh, I mean, he, he absolutely acknowledges that um, the, the seeds of that community integration have been under assault um, for, for centuries, really, and that the, the formal market economy has increasingly replaced the, uh, actually there is a section I could read on this, um, has, has really replaced that, um, that sense of, of, of community ethic. Um, I'm just going to... Um, the, the re yeah, so he's talking about economics and, and growth-based <coughs> economics. He says, the reduction of a society and a culture to dependence on mathematical abstraction has infantilized a grown-up civilization and is well on the way to destroying it. Civilizations self-destruct anyway, but it is reasonable to ask whether they have done so before with such enthusiasm, in obedience to such an acutely absurd superstition, while claiming with such insistence that they were beyond being seduced by the irrational promises of religion. Every civilization has had its irrational but reassuring myth. Previous civilizations have used their culture to sing about it and tell stories about it. Ours has used its mathematics to prove it. Yet when this sh relatively short-lived market society is gone, we will miss its essential simplicity, its price mechanism, its self-stabilizing properties, its impersonal exchange, the comforts it delivers to many, and the freedoms it underwrites. Its failure will be destructive. And this is the thing, he, he, he was not saying 
let's bring down the market-based economy because right now it's all we've got to rely on because we've we've seen such a disintegration of, of, of culture and community. Um, and besides, he believed it would, it would collapse soon enough anyway, well before we were ready. And so what he advocates is that we spend our time rebuilding the informal economy. Um, and this is why he found the transition to be such an inspiring thing, because you know, how do we increasingly pull ourselves out of dependence on money um, and into dependence on, on each other? And the more that we can rebuild those, um, <coughs> I mean, he talks about it as a, as a basket. He says um, culture is like the upright strands that you talk, that you begin with when you're making a basket around which you weave the, the outer strands. Um, and uh, without culture, the community has nothing to, to pull itself together with. Um, and so, yeah, really, as, as you'll find as you read on, um, what he would advocate is devote your time to rebuilding those ties of family and those ties of community. Um, and those creating that identity at the local scale, because he would say it's not local local economies that are that are going to die. It's that the the globalized economy, which completely relies on those, is 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 going to collapse. Um, he uh, he tells the story of the the industrial revolution, um, and he talks about that being initially based on wood, and actually only moving to coal because of the the level of workload that's required, and then that level of workload on ordinary people building to the level where it's completely unrealistic to be sustained. And then that was just about to break. It was just about to all fall apart when suddenly we started tapping into oil. And so that's allowed us to sort of build up to the next level of even greater dependence. Um, and of course, you know, that in itself is a finite resource and, and ties.